August 23, 2001, Captain Robert Pichet reported to work like he did on any other day. He sat inside his Air Transat Airbus 330 assigned to Flight 236 and went through his checklist like he did multiple other times. He then taxied his airplane to the runway where he got clearance for takeoff at 8.52 p.m. Eastern Time. The rest is history. Join us tonight for an absolutely amazing story of the will for survival. Don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this special edition of Rob's Inner Circle Broadcasting Live on my personal Facebook page, at the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel, and on the Rob's Inner Circle Twitch account. Thank you to everybody for tuning in to what is going to be an absolutely amazing evening. I wanted to give a big shout out to my good friend and producer of Rob's Inner Circle, Miss Jenny Duhame. And then another big shout out to another good friend of mine, our podcast techie, Patty Saragosa. Thank you very much, girls, for being there, for making this show as great as it is. We want to give a, an honorable mention to a good friend of ours, a uh, Montreal film producer slash actress, uh, Teresa Picciano. Congratulations. Your film, The 55, has been chosen to be screened at the Hudson Film Festival, among the other entries, which are Silent Majority, But What If We Can Fly, Mask, and Dial W for Wingman. Congratulations to all of you on behalf of myself and everybody here at Rob's Inner Circle. Our merchandise store is up and running. You can get all of our... Uh, Collectible items that are now available on uh, on the store. You can get all of the Rob's Inner Circle and Daily Struggles items. This is a uh, thanks to the effort we have going here, a collective effort with Vincent Gargano, and through his merch store, 514brandingco.com, you can get all of our items. We urge you to go on to the Bobby Short Shorts uh, YouTube channel and check out the playlists and uh, check out our previous podcasts and our web series, Daily Struggles. Uh, you folks can go on there and you can check them out. You can uh, uh, you view them, you give us comments, you give us some thumbs and uh, you share. Subscribe to the channel and of course you want to hit the notification bell because you will be the first to know every time a new production comes up. Well, the folks, it's that time once again to sleep, slip into our weekly ritual. And tonight, I have a beautiful selection of seats in this beautiful Airbus A330. You know, I don't even know which one to choose. They're, they're all nice. So you guys want to take a deep breath, relax, and let us carry the load. We have an amazing show for you guys tonight. It's that time once again, guys. It's showtime. It's time to bring on our guests. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest tonight accomplished a feat that is still recognized today, almost 20 years later, such an amazing event. Um, everything just worked out fine for it to happen the way it did, but still, it took a lot of nerves of steel and a lot of courage and determination. He still remains our national, our international hero. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome retired Air Transat pilot, Captain Robert Pichet. Hi, Robert. How are you? Thank you so much, Mr. Pichet, for being with us. It is our profound pleasure and honor to have you with us. Well, thanks for the invitation and, uh, and uh, say hi to everybody there. Yes, uh, and, and that's you're, you're going to be getting a lot of love tonight. Like I told you, uh, you have such a big, um, a big uh, group of fans in Portugal, especially. Uh, your feet is still recognized today. But let's get, you know, let's get to find out what are you doing these days. How are you keeping busy these days? Well, I've been retired, like like you know, since uh, 2017. My last flight was October 12, 2017. 
2017. And uh, since then, but I'm taking care of my wife, my children. And uh, I used to be a big traveler on my own, with my family, you know. And for the last, uh, last two years, I've been uh, traveling a lot. But since one year, like everybody knows about that uh, COVID-19 there, I had to stay home for a while. And meanwhile, like, like we talk about, for the show stays, stays on, uh, I bought a big monastery and uh, I'm, starting, uh, I'm, starting, uh, uh, I'm starting a show on my, on my own there. Oh, nice. Okay. And the monastery, what kind of services do you offer? It's going to be a therapy for alcoholism and, uh, and a drug addict. Okay. Like like people know, I've been I, I, I have been sober for the last nineteen years. I'm an alcoholic myself, so no, there's no well, there's no proud of that, you know. I mean, if uh, if I didn't quit drinking nineteen years ago, I'd be dead by now. I'm not, I won't be here talking to you tonight. That's for sure, you know. So uh, so that's what I'm I'm trying to get back to the others, you know, to that one, and uh, okay. I'm starting. Uh, a therapy circle on my own. Supposed to open in September first. We'll see. Lots of work. Lots of work. Lots of work ahead for us. All right. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, we're so proud of you. And please let us know you how we can offer you some kind of support in uh, any way we can. If you, you let us know, we're going to announce it on our show. You know what we can do to help you, uh, Mr. Pichet. Oh yes, I will. Count on that. Okay. I just uh, want to brief the audience, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Pichet, his native language is French, of course, and uh, he explained to me that there may be some moments that he may not be too, um, he may not know how to express himself in English. So if he ever says it in French, I will gladly translate it back to English for you. Well, the thing is, it's very hard to, to speak uh, in English with the emotion that, I, that I've been through that night, you know? And uh, when I go deep inside of myself, uh, since since the emotion is uh, pretty high, it's pretty hard to explain. Even in French, sometimes I have a hard time to explain what I felt that night, you know? Well, Mr. Pichet, don't worry about it. Just let yourself go. And uh, if you have to express yourself in French, I'll take up the slack and I will definitely be able to carry on for you. Don't worry about it. So All right. Thank you. Mr. Pichet, it's uh, the 23rd of August, 2001, and now it's a regular work day for you. So you show up at Toronto Pearson Airport. You have like a briefing room where you met with your co-pilot to, to, to discuss the flight plan. Yeah, you have to show it at the airport an hour twice before the flight, Okay. before departure time. Then you go to the briefing room, like you said, and uh, we meet the co-pilot, meet the uh, flight director, give them uh, my last orders. You know, and uh, we check the flight plan if everything is is straightforward, and then we walk to the to the plane. So we end up at the plane maybe in the cockpit about an hour before the departure time, to you know to put up the flight the flight plan in the uh, the computers there because they're about two thirty is a full computerized uh, aircraft. Eh? So uh, by the time uh, you settle the last last thing that comes up, you know, with the fuel, with the passenger, with the catering and you look, you look, you look over that all the time, man. Eh? You don't want, you don't want to run their shows. Everybody is, is counting on you to to take decision. You know. Okay. So, uh, what's part of your flight plan exactly? Is it uh, um, avoiding some certain areas where it's cloudy? It could be like uh, bad weather. Is it uh, emergency airports along the way? What exactly consists in a flight plan? But first, first is the is the road itself, you know, the route, okay. the route itself from the point route, A to yeah. point B. You check okay. if everything is straight, you know, if everything is good, is good for you for that night. Then check the weather, and if you have question about the weather, then you call the dispatcher. We made your flight plan in the afternoon okay. before the flight, so you call him and he gives you a brief on the uh, the weather that you're gonna the uh, encounter in the route. So, uh, so you decided then you can change your route if you if you decide yourself that the route is not adequate to the uh, to the uh, weather. You can change. You can always change your route. You're the last one with the last word. You know, it's, you you're gonna be sitting in that aircraft facing that bad weather. So exactly, uh, it's it's up, it's up to you to change the route if you if you don't like the flight plan that it made the after in the afternoon, and then okay. you look for the is there a mechanical problem with the plane? You know. 
is a, is, a, is the main. You got a lot of check to do, you know, like a lot of protocol to make sure that everything is straightforward. Okay, so because I'm, it's your I, name on the flight plan. It's your name and your license number is on the flight plan. If something happened, you're gonna you're gonna be the one who's gonna be blamed for it. Okay, so uh, it's not even your first officer, your co-pilot. You are personally responsible for that entire flight. Yeah, the co-pilot is there most likely to learn to be a captain. Okay, you know, usually the co-pilot is much younger. He has less experience in total flying hours. He has less experience in the company. Less less experience on the on the machine itself. You know, on the plane okay. itself. So he's there to learn to be a, a captain, to learn about the way about the air transat that goes you know, and all the airports that we go to. And uh, because usually when you when you start working for a big company like Air Transat, you, you usually fly in the in the province of Quebec. You know, inside of the province. Okay. So you, you're not used to go out, uh, out, out, you know, uh, abroad, you know, you don't you go to Europe or down, down out in the Caribbean or whatever. So you have to learn okay. all those, all those new routes to you and all those new airports. So it's kind okay. of a, you're taking experience as a first officer to become a captain one day. And, and he always, he's a pilot like me. He, he follows the same, the same ground school, uh, the ground school instruction, the same, the same practical, uh, Exercise in the air with the simulator and the simulator with the aircraft. Okay. So he's a full time, he's a full time pilot. Checked out on type that the, the plane that you that you're flying. In this case, is Airbus 330. So that guy is a full time uh, pilot on the Airbus 330, but he's the first officer. You're the one okay. who decided yes or no. Do we go? Okay. The, we don't. We don't go. You're the one who decided. Okay, so you're sitting inside your plane, you went through your flight plan, uh, your checklist is a little bit different than your flight plan. I guess your checklist, you're checking, you're, put, well, you're punching in numbers for radio frequencies. Uh, well, it's, what's, all, that, all, that, all that goes with the flight plan. With the flight plan, okay. Because you know uh, where you're going. Of course you know where you're going. So okay. you, know, you know what the frequencies, it's, it's put in the, in the right book, you know, you got a book there. Nowadays we go with iPad, you know. And okay, you know, all, nice. all the airports in the world are in the iPad, the, the iPad and then you shoot the iPad goes, but the frequency goes automatic by by themselves. Okay. As long as you punch in, in the computer the right the right airport that you're leaving from, all the all the frequencies gonna come by itself automatically oh, because that's it's linked it's linked together, you know. Okay, <clears throat> so. You, you went through your flight plan, you went through your, your uh, checklist, and now you're being pushed away by that, uh, that what do you call it, a, a tug? A to, uh, a to, oh, yeah, a tow, a tow truck. A, the tow truck pushes you away, yeah. and then uh, you're, you're taxiing towards the runway, and you're yes. on the runway. And why is it that sometimes that airplanes, they're on the runway, they're sitting there maybe for two minutes, they're waiting and waiting, but it's clear. Why do, they, why do airplanes wait there? Because of the traffic, sometimes okay. as a passenger sitting in the aircraft, you don't see the traffic around you, you know. Okay. But in the cockpit, we know the traffic, and sometimes the traffic is just around the building, around uh -huh. the terminal, that okay. you don't see it coming. And the okay. the ground, the ground, the ground controller, you know, the ATC controller on the ground, he has to give priority for the one. See, it's the first one, okay. first one to come, first one to serve, to be served. Okay. Okay. So, so you're on the you, he, he regulates he regulates his traffic on the ground, make sure that nobody hits each other, you know, just like in the air, same thing. Well, you see, this is one thing a passenger could not know, right? Because he's sitting in the back of you have the full cop uh, cop uh, view, like I have tonight there, anyways. So you know what's going yeah. on, but for the passenger, they're just wondering why is he waiting here? Is anything wrong, you know? <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I guess that explains some, it. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes also when you finish the pushback, and uh, the tow truck goes away, and you try to taxi, and sometimes there's a little warning come up, you know. Ah, okay. After you start the engine, because you start the engine at the end of the at the end of the pushback. Okay. You in communication with the guy on the ground, and okay. he, he helps you to start the engine, make sure that the engine exhaust is clear of anything on the back. 
Then you start first engine, then you start second engine. And okay. sometimes there's a little warning come up, you know, and you can go with that. So you have okay. to call the guy on the ground. He calls the mechanic. Mechanic talks to you on the ground. Tell him what we see, what you got. And he tells you what to do. He can solve it right away. If not, he's going to come up in the aircraft, you know. Oh, wow. Sometimes okay. it's just a warning comes up and, and you have to, to do a little procedure to get to get rid of it. Okay. So you're sitting on the runway uh, at 8.52 exactly um, p.m. Eastern time from Toronto. Uh, the air traffic controller gives you clearance for takeoff. So you're on the runway. You're on your takeoff roll. Take us from there. But before that, Robert, excuse me. Yes. Before that, we were number 11 on takeoff. Oh, okay. There was 10 aircraft in front of us on the taxiway oh, wow. getting ready to take off. Okay. So that put Because... a little pressure, put a little bit more pressure, you know. Your workload, your workload is a bit more because you have to wait on the, and then you have to recalculate your fuel, you know. Uh oh, okay. And make sure that you got, you got the right amount of fuel to get, you get to a list, you know. Okay, so because you're number 10, number 11, so you didn't, you didn't expect that. And, and those planes burn a lot of fuel, eh? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You got to get, you got to get fuel, you got to get a fuel from point A to point B according to the weather. I, you know, according to the weather, then you have to have five percent more. Then wow. you have to, you have to have fuel to an approach where you're going at point B. If you don't land at point B and you have to go to point C. You have okay. to have enough fuel to go to point C also. Oh, there's a lot Weary of things to think fuel, of, right? you know. There's no way an aircraft nowadays is going to run out of fuel. That's, there's no okay. way of it. Okay. All right. So you're on the runway. You get, you're on your takeoff roll. You have clearance. You're airborne. It's yes. an hour into the flight. Everything is normal. And then all of a sudden, something happens. What, you, you got well, some kind of a reading well, on your instruments. Well, it's not all of a sudden like, like jumping in our face, you know. It's, it's, it's kind of a, kind of a, we do checks all the time, you know. So, so since we do checks all the time, uh, we realize that the uh, we had problem with the oil, you know, okay. the oil temperature. So we calling in uh, the the maintenance in Mirabel because we were flying over Montreal at that time. Okay. And uh, he said that there's no problem with it. We'll see. We'll see when you get to Lisbon. Everything was, was cool then, you know. The the uh, engine parameter was equal. Everything was going fine. It's just that we have a little something with the old the old temperature. But it can be the the gauge itself. Okay. It doesn't sure, mean yeah. it's a temperature in, in the in the doesn't mean it's the old temperature. It can be the the, the gauge itself, you know. Okay, so you're getting a reading from uh, this gauge over here, but then all of a sudden, um, that wasn't exactly what was happening. Something else was happening. Well, while you were well, getting I guess, this reading, I guess, I guess we were losing fuel. Okay, but 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 I can't tell you that because it it just it just it only happens in mid ocean, which okay. was something like like uh, almost three hours after the takeoff, you know. Okay, so uh, even though three and a half hours after takeoff. So you're now cruising at 39,000 feet? Yes, 39,000 feet, 800 kilometers an hour, wow. heading, out, heading out to uh, Lisboa in Portugal. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Your right engine flames out? No, no, it, it, it didn't happen. It didn't happen that quick, you know? Okay. Uh, First, I have to tell you when we get, we know uh, an oceanic uh, flight plan, an oceanic flight is divided in three flight plans. Okay. The first flight plan is from point E, the departure airport, like that night was Toronto, and you go over Halifax, the Halifax region. Okay. That's the first authorization, first clearance you're going to get from ATC. Then when you get to the end of the first one, you have to get another one to go across the ocean. And that one comes from Gander. Gander control control half of the half of the west of the Atlantic. Oh wow! The 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 air traffic control from Gander. And when when we got that authorization, 
the clearance from Gander, the guy asked me if I can reroute myself 60 miles south of my previous route, which was on my flight plan. Okay. So and, uh, that, that wasn't a comment. That was just a, an asking, you know. He was asking was there... me because there was too many traffic on the same route that night. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I was the first one. Apparently, I was the first one heading that road. And he said, can you move 60 miles south? If you look at the world map, it shows you that if I go south of my previous route, original route on the flight plan, I get 60 miles closer to the SRS where I landed. So if that wouldn't been if that wouldn't been of that sixty miles reroute, I wouldn't be here tonight talking to you. Oh my god. I would have, ditched, is... I would have ditched the aircraft and that and I mean in the ocean. That that I, I have nothing to do with that. Only accepted like I couldn't I couldn't refuse it, but I decided to accept it. It's unbelievable. That saved, saved saved the life of three hundred and six people. I have nothing to do with it. Wow, but it's all the circumstances, and, and it, we're gonna see, folks, as we're gonna go on with this interview, the circumstances all added added up for this to be like a perfect film, a perfect ending. Okay, so you went off, you went off course, sixty miles, you're at thirty nine thousand feet. There was a a fuel imbalance, right? Were you transferring fuel from the left wing to the right wing at that moment? Well, first of all, there's a uh, little warning came up in the uh, in the uh, dashboard, you know, okay, telling us that we had the potential problem with what, uh, one of the system. And since it's all electronic, you know, since it's all computerized, the uh, fuel page came up and telling us that we had the fuel imbalance from the right reservoir in the wing, uh, according to the left reservoir in the, the left wing, you know? Yeah, we had the fuel imbalance. Okay. And usually pilots of my age, like we call ourselves dinosaur, you know? <laughs> dinosaur. <laughs> I mean, uh, we balance the fuel by memory, you know? Okay. Because that plane was brand new aircraft, you know, it was only in service for a year now. So the plane was quite new. Okay. And then it came up to my mind that we had a fuel leak since we had a fuel imbalance because we didn't eat, eat anything. So what, what could be possible to happen to that plane, late model, you know, that we had a fuel leak. So I said to myself, maybe we got a real fuel imbalance. So I started to, to balance the fuel from left to right. Okay. But now we know, now we know that I was taking the good fuel and putting in a hole in the right, in the right engine, in the right uh, reservoir. Okay. And so it, it took a while before you realized that you were actually feeding the good side to the bad side. And would you have realized that? Was there some kind of a shutoff valve that you can turn on that you could have stopped feeding that engine if you would have known? No, there's no shutting valve of the aircraft on the engine. If you want to okay. shut shut the fuel the engine, you have to shut down the engine itself. Okay. That's why I should have done. Shut down the right engine. But then again, there's one thing you got you got you know, there's one thing that you that you have to keep in mind. Uh, that's the human factor. Yes, I'm a regular human, you know. I'm not. I'm not sur surhuman. I mean, I mean, I'm a human, and, exactly. and the fact for 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 human to realize that uh, we have fuel problem in mid ocean at night, it means that you know. That's what wow. it means for a regular person, and for a captain like myself with the experience that I had, that's not the that's not the kind of uh, emergency you want to have over the ocean. With your problem, I could have, but I could have, have a, a, a fire engine, and I would have extinguished it. You know, could have a passenger fighting on the back with his wife. Okay, have, get them separated, then there's a problem. You know, but, sure. But a fuel problem for a captain in mid in mid ocean at thirty nine thousand feet at night. I guess 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 the man in me a little bit. You know, he came up to my mind that I'm gonna die that night. Wow. But what's going on is that you're transferring the fuel. So at one point, your right engine stopped. Right? Your right well, engine stopped? Well, before, before we stopped, 
balancing the fuel, we decided with the first officer to declare an emergency. Okay. And we and we turned the plane towards the Azores. But at that point, everything was going fine. You know. I Again, just, that's another. I would. I just had that that fuel balance going, which is not a big problem usually. But in a preventive way, I decided to go to the SRS, and the SRS was my emergency landing trip if something happened over the ocean with my with my flight or with the plane. Okay. It's not it's not a something that I decided to go by myself. It's it was my flight plan. If something happened, I have to go to the SRS. So we decided to declare an emergency. And why did I decide to go to the SRS? Because I was 300 miles from from Tessera Airport where I landed, and I was 600 miles from Lisbon. Oh, okay. So I decided to myself we go 300 miles short time. You know, if something happened with what we have, since we don't understand what's going on in the plane, well, we'd be closer to, to a landing strip, and maybe we're gonna be able to land over there. You know, and that's exactly what happened. But when I took that decision, everything was going fine. You know, we are just, all we had is the fuel on balance that we thought we had. Okay, so your red engine gives up at 39,000 feet. At that moment, you had to go lower because you were telling me before the interviews that you can't fly with one engine at that altitude. So you had to go yeah, to a lower true. altitude. That's true, but, but, it, but it, you know, when the little warning, laid up in the in the in the uh, dashboard to the land to the land to the landing in Tercera. it took 42 minutes oh okay and before the first engine uh, quit on us the right didn't quit on us it's uh, we spent 24 minutes you know and okay. then the second engine quit on us and we had 18 minutes to go on with okay so with now no, the no second engine, with no engine power so the second engine quits on you. You're at, at what? At thirty-three thousand feet at that moment. Thirty-three thousand feet. Yes. Thirty-three thousand feet. Like, and you were like telling before the the plane cannot hold that altitude with one engine. There's not okay. enough pressure, uh, air pressure to That's give right. the uh, to give the lift of the plane. So we have to go down. And our in our uh, in our uh, ceiling was uh, was twenty-seven thousand feet. We were aiming at. Okay. So it was supposed to go down at 27,000 feet, and the plane, according to the, according to the limitation, the plane would have been old, okay, with one engine at 27,000 feet with the weight we had at night. But okay. on the way down to 27,000 feet, at 33,000 feet, when we were going through 33,000 feet, the second engine quit on us. You were telling me uh, before the interview that when the second engine quit on you, you said you saw a black wall in front of you. Your co-pilot yeah, was, I was like, "Yeah, I was going sorry. to die." You know, that's exactly where I was going. Wow! Well, so no way a plane, a plane with 150 feet wingspan, weight 155 tons. I'm not talking about pounds. I'm talking about tons. You know. With 306 wow. people on board of that craft, that aircraft is gonna is gonna make it because we were 160 kilometers from there, Sarah. At that moment, okay. There's no way in my mind, as a human being and as a as a experienced captain, that we're gonna reach that egg, we're gonna reach that island with the situation we were in, you know. Okay, so, so you, I said to myself, we're gonna we're gonna ditch the the aircraft, and then. We're all gonna die, you know. Oh boy. Okay, but so you're flying the aircraft, all you could hear is wind because it, it must be the most unusual feeling because anytime you're up there, you're always hearing the engines running. For for the first time in your life, there's no engines running. You're flying an airplane and there's the ocean be right at the bottom of you. Your co pilot is like panicked and you're panicked yourself. All you hear is wind. And you're flying your airplane. Um, you, your initial idea was to ditch, but then at some point you saw the island. What happened exactly? Did you make eye contact with the island? 
Well, I ask the uh, air traffic controller uh, on the ground to flash the uh, runway runway lights. Oh. To see if uh, if we were aiming at the island because Asares Island there's a multiply island. You know, there's many islands. Oh, there's that's right. Islands. Yes. Okay. There's three inter there's three international airport in the Asares Island. You know, and we we're okay. going to Tercera. So I ask him to flash the the runway light, and I saw from the horizon. I oh. said I'm flashing. We were lucky that night because the weather was good. We had good weather that night. So there was because, no clouds. Because we, was we, no... Heard, we heard after the landing from the uh, chief uh, fire, fire, fire worker, firefighters. He said that uh, the night before that we landed, so the night from the 20 to, 22nd to the 23rd, the uh, port of Tersora was fogged in. So there was no sailing and no visibility. And the three nights that I was in place there, the airport Tercera was fucked in. Unbelievable. So the only night it was sky sky clear was the night of the 23rd to the 24th, you know. Another thing was that was playing on our side, which has no which I have no control on it. Unbelievable. So you, you veered off 60 miles from your course and then you had the instinct of uh, a, a calling an emergency and then those lights flashed and the weather was clear, everything was good, you saw the lights. When you saw those lights over there, did you all of a yeah. sudden get some kind of a burst, some, let's say, confidence, you know what, we're going to try this, let's do it? Well, I won't call it confidence. I would call that... Uh... There's an opening, there's an opening of the answer of the problem. At least I see the, the light flashing, I see the island, I look at my height, you know, my altitude, and I look at the way the plane moves around, and uh, it doesn't go down fast. So I tell myself, if the two engine that quit on us, is going to go down fast to keep uh, the minimum airspeed, to get that leaf on the wing, the lift on the wing, in order not to not to stall you know but 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 by time we were going 300 feet a minute so i realized that if i keep the airplane high you know the, the height of the airplane become my fuel yes so as long as i get i get i get i i i might have a chance to make it to the uh, to the island and if i make it to the island and i don't make it to the airport I land on a beach. I land on a road. I land on a on a field. It's much better than than ditch on the ocean. Definitely, you know? yes. Okay. You're gonna break the plane. You're gonna kill people. But at least you have you're gonna save some lives. You know, which is my priority as a captain. It's uh, to assure okay. the secure the safety of the passenger on the plane. But as as much as I was getting uh, keeping the plane high. And I was getting closer to the airport, to the island. I realized that I could make it to the airport. And then the and adrenaline comes in rush, rush yes, in, you know. Yes. And and then you 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 start to think to yourself, I'm gonna have a chance to make landing at the airport. Yes. And then then the adrenaline flows in like like crazy. It's, it's a, an incredible sensation. I can tell you that. When they say that uh, all your senses, your five senses, work at 150 percent, I can tell you it's true. You know. Okay, but what didn't help you either is that you, you, you your plane was handicapped. You had no hydraulics. That means you could not pull out your 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 uh, flaps and your leading edge slats. So well, you were going had, much faster. I had one 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 slot one slot from the slats. Usually there's three, there's three, uh, three movements, the slot when you you do a regular landing. But with the situation that I was in, it gives you one one shot of the slats. When you keep wow. the gear down, one slats comes out, you know, not more than one slot. Because there's a little uh, rameter bank at the end of the wing. The right wing comes up when you lose a second engine to give okay. you a little bit of electricity and a bit oh, of boy. hydraulics. Wow! Give okay. you the minimum that you need for about half an hour to make to make a landing. Totally unbelievable! So you saw the airport, and now all of a sudden you got a, a 
a big burst of courage and your nerves are still kicked in, but you were still going too fast. So you dropped your landing gear it's still at a high altitude because you wanted to slow down the plane a little bit, right? Uh, well, it's something I never practiced before, you know, and I never heard of uh, such a story from some other aircraft before me, you know, so I didn't know how the plane is going to be react when I put the gear down because the weight of a uh, of a landing gear on the Airbus 330 is 20 ton, hey. and 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 when when you open when you open the cage of the landing landing uh, landing strip there, the the there's a there's a big wall that likes a big wall you know it comes down then the gear comes out and that and that panel go back in okay. to make sure that you land normally, but in that situation when the panel comes out to make the landing gear to go down. That panel stays out. Okay. You cannot bring it bring it back in. You no. Know? So so I said to myself, I'm gonna have a lot of drag. And if I don't keep altitude high when I put the gear down, maybe, gonna, maybe I'm gonna have to go fifteen hundred feet a minute to keep the minimum speed to keep my lift on the wings to make sure that I don't stall once again, you know? Oh wow. So I have to keep <clears throat> altitude high. In case one of them gonna get the gear down, is something that thing happened, but it didn't happen. That's what. That's what I. Unbelievable. What I mean. It didn't happen. Okay, so apparently you I were was, still I was too, too high. high and too fast. Okay, but you had to do a three hundred and sixty degree turn. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, we did that. It was altitude and last last year the speed that we had we had the in the, in reserve. Because when okay. you land a big plane like that, you have kind of a B on a slot, you know. Okay. A big aircraft will weight 155 tons. You cannot decelerate that aircraft by simply shutting down the engine. You got a no. momentum, you know. You got a way to go. Just like a big 18 wheels on the on the, on the highway. You okay. want if you put the brakes on, you won't stop in the, you know. You got, you you got a momentum. Yeah. Okay, so you're lined up for the runway, and and uh, you actually end up touching that runway a thousand feet farther at a much double the speed you're supposed to come in, and then you yes. bounce off the yeah. the tarmac, which was exceptional because if you would have hit too hard, the undercarriage would have went all the way up, and the plane would have lost its landing gear. But it was just enough for you to bounce off the runway and land. How how farther? How much farther uh, 2, did you land? Two thousand feet. We went. We went thirty feet in the air and two oh thousand feet forward. And, and another but element. Once again, once again, I didn't know what to do. You know, I didn't know how that plane is going to be reacted, because exactly. when when we were landing up on the runway on funnel, I didn't have the attitude of a landing. You know, because okay. I, my nose wasn't high enough, so I knew that oh. something's going to happen when I be touching the runway. But I didn't know I'm gonna bounce up 30 feet in the air and move forward 2,000 feet. I didn't wow. know that because I never practiced that before, you know. And then the plane, uh, after those 2,000 feet, touched the ground, and both you and your co-pilot, you had your feet on the brakes, and the plane came to a complete stop. Now well, you well, stop. Well, I knew I knew from my, my experience that I couldn't bounce up two or three or four times because. I have only 30% of uh, the control of that aircraft. I lost 70% oh. of the capability of that aircraft okay. since I had, I had no engine, you know, no engine power. So I didn't have too much. I, I didn't have much to play with, you know? Wow. Okay. So, so, so I knew that if I bounce up a second time, I'm going to lose control of the plane. And then oh. I'm going to uh, stumble in down, go or go. Go on top, you know, and break the plane in four and, and kill people. So yeah. I knew I had to stop that bouncing effort. So when okay. I, when the plane touched after the first bounce, uh, the, the wheel touched the ground again. I said, I'm going to put up the brake and we'll see what happened. And when I did that, the plane stuck on the ground and, and it, it became like a normal landing. Wow. And what also played in your favor is that that runway was unusually long. It was 11,000 feet. And you had just enough runway for you to stop. Well, that, that runway, it's uh, half military, Portuguese, and American. 
you know when when the uh, when the shuttle plane goes goes in the in the space, he's got three runway around the world where he can land. Okay. One in China, one in uh, in uh, California, and the other is the third one. Oh wow! So so even the space shuttle can land there, you know. So that's why the the runway is long. So you had everything, absolutely everything, playing in your favor that night. So the plane and, comes and in. That's right, but but it's something that I didn't I didn't do anything for that. It just it just happened like that, you know. Exactly. All I was. So your plane comes to a complete stop. I guess you and your co-pilot must have looked at each other, and you're there like. I give. I give probably a high five. Yeah, a high, high five. High five. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so you guys definitely you were very happy and all that, but but you told me that the first thought that came into your mind is that you were okay. This is all nice and all that, but what's the first thought that came to your mind? What, what did you tell me? Right, was, yeah. When when I jumped myself in the chute, there, you know, I was the last one to leave the aircraft. Make sure that okay. I was the last one on the plane, and uh, I thought to myself that I'm gonna lose the, I'm gonna lose my job, you know. That's the first thing came up to my mind because I worked hard to get to get to that place, you know, uh, pilot in command on a big aircraft around the world. And uh, I knew that I was only a little captain facing a big company like, like Airbus, you know. So I was David against David against Goliath, you know, some some kind of. And when you read story and you read the report of uh, accident previous previous mine it's always a captain who get hit by it you know like uh, if the guy survived it's always his fault when you talk about the uh, Sully in New York yes they tried, they, tried, yes. they tried to put the blame on him too you know and the guy saved the people it is the way that's the way it goes like I said before at the beginning of, the, of our, our interview it's him on the fly pen so you're the one who responsible for what happened and during your flight, you know, whatever what happened, you're responsible for it, you know. And uh, what what was your co-pilot's reaction, Dirk the Younger? What was his uh, reaction? Well, he was a kind of a bit uh, happy like me to be alive, you know. It's not even the happy that we land. We're more happy than to be alive. It's more likely we survive. We're gonna be survivors, you know. And yes. He was he was he was happy to be alive and. He was happy that he was part of the crew that we survived that, you know. It's incredible what happened to us. We're gonna remember it all all our lives, you know. I mean uh, we we did something something special. Something special happened to us that night, you know. Unbelievable. Because I, yeah. I worked 16, 16 years after that, still flying wow. there post 30 for the same company. And once in a while I was meeting flight attendant, which was with me that night. And it was funny because all the other flight attendant on the flight, they knew that that flight attendant was on the flight with me, and they were kind of eager to see the reaction we're gonna have when we're gonna meet in the in the uh, in the crew room, you know. We lost your sound, Mister Pichet. Oh, you're back. You're, you're you're back now. You're back. Now you hear me again? Y yes, yes, we hear you. Yes, yeah. So that's what happened. You know, people was looking at us to see our reaction when we meet, because uh, once in a while I was meeting flight attendant, which was with me that night. You know. Okay. What an amazing story, Mr. Pichet. I tell you that um, today, twenty years later, you still remain my hero. I, I absolutely. The day that that happened, I go wow. You know, one day I have to meet this gentleman, and here we are, almost twenty years later, we have met. <laughs> and I, yeah, I want to congratulate you. I want to congratulate well, you personally. Well, I accept your congratulations, but you know, when I get congratulated like that, I always wish that my crew was with me because they did a great job too. The crew, you know, the first officer did what he had to do. The flight director, all the flight attendants. They all, did, they all did what they had to do that night, even though they thought they thought that during 42 minutes they're gonna die for sure. And when it was time mm -hmm. to evacuate the craft, they did their job to evacuate, you know, in the single way, the right, the right time, the right way, you know. 
So the, so when I get congratulated, like you just did, I like to be, my crew to be with me, you know, because we we've been through something together, real strong, you know. But you know what? It's not only yourself, your co-pilot, and the crew. Even even the passengers on the plane, because they played their part. Because I guess you know it, it, during the whole ordeal and in spite of this very trying moment in their lives, they were warriors and they stuck in there and uh, they didn't, you know, like panic or whatever. They just stayed there like real champions. And I think everybody oh, yeah. did their part here. Oh yeah. They listened, they listened to the flight, the flight attendant instruction, you know, and they did what they had to do too. Hey, eh? so they could have gone panic. They could have gone anywhere, you know, anyway. And they, 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 they did what they had to do, and everybody was only six minor injury on the on the evacuation, you know, which is pretty great, eh? I, I mean, I would, I would find that phenomenal, unbelievable. So this event here changed your life forever because right now you have set up, uh, right now, it's been a while, you have the Robert Pichet Foundation, and you also bought a monas monastery that's working under Robert uh, PCA Foundation. So tell us a little bit about your foundation, what you do. Well, you know, in 2002, uh, I was declared an alcoholic, so I, I went through therapy. And through that therapy, I see people who lost everything due to the alcohol, you know. And I said to myself, hey, I come up good out of that, and I stay sober, I'll try to help the others. And that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. And lately, I'm good enough, uh, lucky enough to buy that monastery. And we're going to start our own therapy for the for people who have problem with uh, alcohol and uh, and drugs. You know? So uh, my my foundation, what we do for the last 20 years, we we uh, we gather money, you know, through through uh, sponsors, and we give that to the therapy houses, therapy houses that they had problem with the financial problem. But now, since we started our own th therapy uh, uh, monastery, the other one is going to go to the monastery and try to help others. That's kind of a, my uh, my retirement project, you know. Well, it, it's such a great uh, it's a, 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 such a great act on your part, and it's very commendable, uh, very nice of you. And and of course, you know that you have a second lease on life because, like you said, uh, if we're talking here tonight. And I give you a high five, <laughs> yeah, like you did to your your co-pilot. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's a miracle that you're here tonight, and uh, I'm so glad, and uh, I'm happy for you and everybody on that plane that survived. On behalf of myself and everybody in our show, congratulations to you all, um, and I'm sure Air Transat give you a lot of support for you to go through this traumatism that you want, right? Oh yeah, so that's, something, that's something else, you know. I mean, everybody talks to me about that flight every day since the last twenty years, you know. You know, I'm, I'm I like to go hunting. Uh -huh. Sometimes I tell people I shot a deer last week, and they said, "Oh yeah, but I bought the flight two thirty six. Like, like they not they don't get interested in something else in my life. All people wants to know." It's about the flight 236. <laughs> I've been telling that story for the last 20 years. I can tell you that. Well, you know what? I understand, terms... why. I understand why. It's something It's something very special, you know? It's something big. Sometimes I come up in the morning, you know? I wake up in the morning and I feel okay about it. And some other time I wake up in the morning and I said to myself, something special happened to me that night, you know? And I can get over it, you know? It's something else. Absolutely, because you're a, a role model, not only in the way you handle the emergency in this situation, but also the aftermath. It's what you're doing after that accident today to be helping others, you know, to be pulling through to something that you went through. So that's very commendable, Mr. Pichet. Well, thank nice. you very much. Yeah, thank you. So well, with the little time we have left, we didn't even have a chance to get to know you a little bit. So you were born in Quebec City, is that right? Yeah, I was born in Quebec City itself, yeah. Okay, and yeah. then you moved to Montjoly? Yeah, we moved to Montjoly, which is about 600 kilometers east, east of uh, Quebec. Okay, and so, so uh, word has it that you were playing with your friends, and every time you would see an airplane uh, landing or taking off, you would stop and you would look at that admirably. Well, that's, what my, that's what my mom told me, you know, that when I was younger and played with my friends outside, and we were leaving from 
close to the airport. And every time a plane was landing or taking off, I was st- stop playing while the other was keep on playing, you know. <laughs> and I was stop playing myself and look at the aircraft. And I was asking myself at that young age, how can two guys be sitting in the cockpit and make a thing flying, you know? I was I was intrigued by it, you know. So that's probably why I became a pilot. Because there's no pilot in my in my family whatsoever. Well, it, can you imagine from that moment when you were a little child to observing those two two people up there? It could have been a woman as well, and they're flying a plane, and you're admiring them, and you actually did that same career for all those years. Yeah, my my, my dream, my my child dream was to go around the world as a captain on a plane, and I did succeed it. To, and I succeeded it in 2010. Okay. In 2010, I didn't, do, I didn't do it. I didn't do it in one shot, you know, in one flight. I've done it through my 45 years of career. I've done it in, in, by part. And the last part that I had missing was from Jakarta, Indonesia, to the Hawaii, Hawaii Islands. Nice. In, 2000, in 2010, I've done that flight with the Airbus 330. So absolutely amazing. So I, did, okay. so I succeed to make my my dream come true. Uh, you flew many aircraft at Air Transit. You started off with the Lockheed L-1011, you were telling me, right? Yeah, I was there. I was captain for five years on the 1011. Best aircraft the, I even flew. You like that airplane? Uh, best aircraft that I ever flown. Oh, yeah. Amazing. That's 100% okay. for sure. Did you, did you because try I'm a, the... I'm, a, I'm a handler, you know. I'm a big, I'm a big truck driver. Okay. I'm a big handler. You let the Cadillacs. I'm not cerebral. I'm not in my mind. I'm, I'm a handler, you know. And and the 1011 was was a plane that can handle handle pretty good. And so they retired the planes and they start bringing the newer planes. Did you ever try the 737-800? Was that part of your fleet? The Boeing no, 737. No, the fleet was the Boeing 330 only. The Boeing oh. 757. While I was flying the 1011, they get rid of the 757-2. Then they buy, they bought uh, Airbus 30. Okay. And so, um, what is the advice that you can give to young uh, pilots uh, getting out of pilot school right now? What's the advice that you can first, give them? First, first, uh, first, it's mandatory to have the passion. If you don't have the passion in the aviation, there's no way you're going to make it because then, first year of your work. If everything goes right, you're gonna you're gonna eat your socks off, you know, because you don't make good money, you don't have good 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 uh, salary, you don't have good uh, working condition, you know, and then you have to build up your hours as a first officer, and sometimes you have to go away, far away from your home, you know, from your friend, from your girlfriend, and you have to work up north or whatever whatever the job brings you brings you at, you know. So it's pretty rough. The first 10 to 15 years, it's pretty rough to succeed. So if you don't have the passion, there's no way you're going you're gonna to make it, you know, make, make it to the big league. And now with that, with that pandemic thing that we're going through right now, can you imagine all the aviation company are on the ground? Eh? Wow. So uh, yes. there's a lot of experienced pilots right now. They don't work. When the thing comes back on, it's going to have a thing. And there's no... And the, the little guy wants to be a pilot now. He's going to have to last at least the next 15 years before you make it, you know, because of the pandemic that we're, we're going through right now. Are you still in contact with your uh, co-pilot that evening, Dirk the Yager? Well, my, my older daughter was working for Emirates Airlines as a flight attendant on first class on the 380, Airbus oh, wow. 380. And Dirk was the captain on Airbus 380 for for Emirates. I say once been, in a while they were they were they were flying together, you know, and they knew it. They knew each other. So when they were going to destination at night, having a supper, they always called me or sent me photo that they they were lunching together with the rest of the crew, you know. So that was quite 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 funny. I'm going to be honest with you, Mr. Pichet. We did our best to try to get in contact with your co-pilot, Dirk de Yager, but we, we, we weren't able. We tried through Facebook. We tried through Instagram. It was impossible. We wanted to surprise you, but unfortunately, uh, we, we couldn't do it. 
Well, it be, you know, nice. he, 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 lost, he lost his job right now. He's, uh, he's out of work right now, you know? I know, so I know. Going, guys, guys are, uh, at their age, uh, right now, they have a hard time to go through because they haven't worked for, for the last year. They don't see when they're going to work again. So, you know, and they're not, they're, there must be something like four or five today. He's not too old, you know? I mean, he still have a, a good 15 or 20 years to give again. So... Maybe the guys are not too in a good mood to talk to anybody. Right now. I guess they try to, to make themselves a living because he had, yes. I heard the last that I heard, he had three kids now, you know, so he has to supply for them and everything like any father of the family, you know. So that's probably why he's not too much on the on the uh, social or social network. Yeah. Well, and if you do have a chance to speak with him, please uh, tell us you were on our show and Give us our kindest regards and our uh, sure. congratulations because you two worked so hard that evening. And also a, a fact to note is that on the evening of that event, you had logged 16,800 hours of flying, which is like more than average for a captain to have because there's a lot of captains on airplanes that have five, six, 7,000 hours of flying. You had 16,800 and I'm sure that played some kind of a factor. Well, well, there's no, there's no big deal about my my hours of my flying hours because when I stopped flying in 1973, I mean, all the people who was flying with me, my colleague, they my friends that I met at that time the aviation. We all end up about the same rate of uh, amount of hours, you know. Like I, when I retired, I was close to 20,000, and we're just about all the same. Same, but but now the the job has has changed. You know, they don't work as much as we used to work, so they don't fly as much, and maybe they retire today at, at 65 with something like 10 or 12. But I remember my my old captains that I had when I was a young first officer, they retired with 25, 26, 27 thousand hours long time. You know, wow. So it goes on a bit with the from generation to generation. Yeah, the amount of flying hours goes down, eh? Mr. Pichet, it was such a, an immense pleasure to have you on our show. Thank you so much. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the big screen. I'm going to be signing off. And uh, please stay, stay behind because we're going to come back with the producer and the podcast uh, technician. We'd like to continue just a little bit, have a little bit of a meet and greet. Well, uh, so, I'm the first officer tonight with you, so... I can I listen to my captain. I'm That's the captain right. tonight. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Yes, sir. Pichet, stay backstage. Would you like to say bye-bye to everybody before I sign you off? Yeah. Thank you for the invitation, you know, and I hope that uh, the people who listen to your broadcast uh podcast uh, like like what they what they heard tonight, you know. Monsieur Pichet, vous voulez vous adresser à des publics québécois là, quelques petites paroles en français là, avant qu'on quitte. Ah, mais c'est sûr, il doit, avoir, il doit avoir des Québécois à travers ça, Canadiens. Allez-y, laissez-vous là, ça les dit. J'espère qu'ils ont, qu ont compris tout ce que j'ai dit, mais de toute façon, les Québécois, ça fait 20 ans qu'ils n'entendent parler du vol 36 parce qu'on a fait un film, il y a une biographie qui a été écrite, puis le film passe continuellement, même après 20 ans, encore à la télé, une ou deux fois par année. Puis, il y a même des reportages qui se font encore. Donc, c'est sûr que les Québécois sont au courant de mon histoire plus que le monde en, en dehors du Québec. Tu sais. Mais je suis content que, que vous me disiez qu'il y a une couple de Québécois à soir qui, qui est clé. Puis, je souhaite euh, bonne soirée à tout le monde. Monsieur Piché, vous êtes mon héros personnel et vous êtes notre héros personnel à tout le monde international. Un gros merci à vous. Quittez pas, là, on s'en vient vous rejoindre. Là. OK, c'est bon. N'oubliez pas, j'ai juste fait ma job ce soir-là. Okay. Bonne soirée. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning into the special edition of Rob's Inner Circle. Uh, such a delightful guest we had tonight. It was a lot of fun. So, folks, um, stay tuned on Monday night when we return to our regular programming. We're going to have comedian Natasha G. Filion. Signing off from my Airbus A330, this is Captain Delessio bidding you farewell. Until Monday, good night, everybody.